I'm going to start again. Good evening, everybody. Good evening. Good evening. I'm going to start off with some questions. But before I do, are there any questions? Mr. I, you don't have a question? No? Okay. Okay. Well, then I am going to start off with some questions that I got. I got one or two from that last class where we talked about <clears throat> securities inside Trader, chapter 16, and we talked about uh, Martha Stewart. I had one person that said, Martha Stewart's arrest was the best thing that ever happened to her. <laughs> she doesn't have to be perfect anymore. <laughs> Uh, I thought that was very interesting, <laughs> and I don't know, maybe I agree with that. Uh, but she's still kind of holding on to it, but if we want to remember, some of the pertinent facts are that she, uh, she bought some stock from a friend. The friend, she also has a friend who is a stockbroker. The friend that she bought the stock from stockbroker is the same stockbroker as her stockbroker. So she knew that she should have known that what she was doing was not right. And so um, although we did agree that she didn't need to go to jail for it, <coughs> if she had gotten advice from her business lawyer, they would have told her not to do that. And then I got another question regarding chapter 19 for the antitrust, somebody said, what is the most likely situation for antitrust to ensue? And so there was something very interesting that uh, occurred in the news last week. And so I'm going to start here. <clears throat> and then, um, before we go into that, I want to remind you about Socrative. If you want to participate in that, uh, later on we might have one or two questions. You'll remember that when you go in, you'll put in Prof Blackmore and then click Join. But for this purpose, I want to start here. And you'll ask me later why I'm starting there. Go to this one. <laughs> Thank you guys for both coming in. It's a short note. It's a pleasure. So we have art today. Caitlin drew this. Oh, oh, this is great. I love the little uh, sticky things. Well, no, I put those there. Just to cover the oh wow, that's well, some rough language there. Some of the combinations are yeah, really. We don't talk like this at home. It's called Daddy and Direct TV. I would never say any of these words out loud. I wouldn't. Okay. I wouldn't think it. It's an artistic expression. Good, good to know. Even though Direct TV now says they're ten dollars a month, it's not. You can't get it without their wireless plan, so it's ten times more than they say. And there's no NFL network. And there's still I just can't have this on the wall. Obviously, of course not. It's artistically, though, it's very good. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> I love that spectrum. Spectrum doesn't happen. Direct TV bad. Spectrum good. Okay. So, what I want to tell you about is this thing that happened in the news last week uh, because AT&T is attempting to buy Time Warner. Now, the reason that you see it here in Politico is because everything <laughs> that has to do with our new president turns out to be a political issue, and Time Warner owns CNN. Everybody thinks that this is about CNN, but when you look deeper, this is a serious antitrust issue. And so I want to see if I can blow this up just a bit and show you.
Okay, so you asked me why am I showing you that commercial? That commercial is a commercial about Spectrum. Spectrum, I told you, I used to have my cable with Time Warner Cable, and they turned into Spectrum, and I'm like, I'm confused. And then Spectrum does this commercial, and this guy's complaining about Direct TV, TV, but I remember I used to have Direct TV, which is now owned by AT&T. And so, when I go into my account, and I go and pull it up, it talks all about Time Warner Cable. And so, Time Warner Cable, which is a cable company, now wants to, which already, at and which already owns DirecTV, now wants to own Time Warner Cable. And so when we talked about antitrust, the whole idea of antitrust is to, uh, we want to, uh, the government wants to discourage monopolies. When companies create monopolies, then that has an effect on consumers. Because now, if AT&T owns Time Warner Cable and DirecTV, then that is going to start looking like a monopoly. And so um, when you look at this article down at the end, uh, after they get through all of the talk about CNN, which really this isn't about CNN, <clears throat> the trouble is really going to come in because it's the direct TV that's going to create the monopoly situation. And so um, this is how a monopoly situation will come into play. Uh, to answer that person's question. And then that's going to bring us. <laughs> were we talking, we talked about that commercial last week. Yes, right? and I said, yeah. you know what? I'm going to bring up my favorite commercial. <laughs> and they really have like a whole line of monster commercials uh, that come in there. And see, so this is going to bring us to extra credit question number one. Okay, so can you see this? I'm going to turn this light back on. And so the first person who is going to be able to raise their hand is going to be the person that I'm going to call on. Hold on. All right, I see you. Keep it up, keep it up. But I'm going to bring you your prize. You know I like to bring you your prize. <laughs> now, remember, you're going to turn this back in with your exit ticket so that I can remember to give the points to the right person. So don't leave it on your desk. Remember to turn that in. Yes, ma'am. So you you have the answer to all the blanks. Yes. <clears throat> Does section section two of the Sherman Act was designed to prevent business monopolies? And I'm going to take that. Um, I I really would rather call it the Sherman Antitrust Act, Act, but I'm taking Sherman Act or the Sherman Anti or the Sherman Antitrust Act. Okay, so congratulations. I have a winner. Mm. Now, right up here in the front. <laughs> okay. All right. See, that's painless. All right. So now we're going to move on, you all. All right. And that's our answer. That's, that's coming straight from, from that slide that we had that talks about the uh, Sherman Antitrust. Okay, so I have a question for you already. Here's our question. AT&T already owns the cable television company, DirecTV. 
If AT&T is allowed to acquire Time Warner Cable, which is also a cable tele television provider, will this have a substantial effect decreasing competition in the cable television market? Yes. So, APS B for now. Yeah, that's going to make my cable bill go up. And so the government will be uh, concerned with discouraging that type of activity. All right. <clears throat> so now let's move into today's activity. We're going to be talking about intellectual property. Okay, and so I want to start off, the book has this nice little chart right here that gives us all of our little areas of intellectual property law type protections. Okay, and the first stop is trade secrets. And then uh, the book talks about trademarks, service marks, trade dress. And then they talk about copyrights. And then the book talks about patents. I'm going to talk about patents before copyrights today. Trade, trademarks, trade dress, and patents together uh, because there's some design patents that take on the likeness of trade dress. And so then it gives you this nice little chart here that talks about the different sources of law for each one of these. You all know how much I love sources of law. <laughs> I'm just going to let you look at that. And now, uh, <coughs> Mr. Isaac, uh, did you did see the clues that I put out there for you? Did, did you appreciate that? Mm -hmm. So I did post the clues for the extra credit out there for you all. Did you like how I just put them all right? Just boom, boom, boom. You didn't like that? That's perfect. <laughs> And so here we are, here are some of our clues, just for some of you who missed, missed the clues. Okay. All right, so let's talk about trade secrets. And then our book tells us that trade secret protections are provided by state statutes and or state common law. <clears throat> And then it gives us this nice little definition of a trade secret. I want to highlight that for you because you know you want to make sure you go back and pay close attention to that in your textbook. The trade secret is a formula, a pattern, a compilation, program, device, method, technique, or process that meets the following criteria. It, der it derives ind independent economic value, actual or potential, from not being generally known. Okay? That's where the value is going to come from. And it is the subject of efforts that are reasonably under the circumstances to maintain its secrecy. Obviously, all of us know that none of us have ever met anybody that knows the formula to Coca-Cola. Mm -hmm. It is a secret. If anybody knows it, you can tell me now, though. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and that is how it maintains its protection because those people, they go through great lengths to make sure that nobody knows. Nobody in all these years have, you know, everybody, if not, I mean, there's this little slathering of somebody who says they think today, but nobody has ever been able to make Coca-Cola like Coca-Cola. So that means that it is maintaining uh, criteria one and two. It derives an independent economic value from not being general, generally known to and not being readily ascertainable by proper means by other persons who can obtain economic value from its disclosure or use. And then here is one great advantage of a trace. It maintains that protection over other forms of intellectual property for an infinite period of time, forever. Get ready. Okay. <laughs> well, can I read it? Oh, 
No, no, go ahead. Keep, you can keep hearing that. See, I try to put, sometimes I just never know, you might find an answer right on the slides. Trade secret protections are derived from which two sources? You know how much I love sources of law. Source, sources of law. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Yes, state statutory law and state common law. Wow. We got her out of the way. It was a more scandal. Wow. <laughs> Wow, man. I, I, let me tell you, I was just going to take statutory law or common law because, you know, I, I did. But wow. Okay. Wait a minute. This might be too easy. The last time no, y'all almost gave chapter. me a heart attack, so I just. I okay. Very good. Okay, so you remember. <laughs> so you remember, you remember my favorite slide. This is like, you know how much I love. And which one is my favorite, y'all? Common law. It's common law. To me, all law is common law. Eventually, as I have said to you, the judge can care less. If I go up to the judge and I say, Judge, Hear ye, hear ye, your honor. May it please the court. I can go in and say it in all nice kinds of ways. I can be as intellectual, no pun intended, as possible. But when I go to the judge and I start, see, judge, here is a statute. Let me start reading it for you, judge. You ready? He could care less what I think that statute means. He's going to say, where is your case, counsel? The common law, which will interpret what that statute means. And so here, this nice little chart was giving it a look. It talks to us about our hierarchy of our different sources of law. You have your state constitution, your state statutory, your state common, your federal common law. In this case, our trade secrets are normally going to be covered by state statutory law or state common law. Okay, very good. Okay, now. I want to talk to you about trademarks. And then in our text, it kind of, they talk about it all together. The trademark, service mark, and the trade dress, all in one area. And I want to pay close attention to this word here, non-functional. It's kind of like a un, it's like a non-word, you know, like it's kind of confusing. Non-functional, a non-functional has nothing that this trademark cannot really have anything to do with the functionality of this thing. A non-functional distinctive word, name, shape, symbol, phrase, a combination of words and symbols that helps consumers to distinguish one product from another. And then our book talks to us about the statute, the Langham Act is a federal statute that protects an owner's registered trademark from use without the owner's permission. And then the book tells us that most case law and legal texts refer to both trademarks and service marks as a mark. And then they distinguish it too, while trademarks are typically associated with the product Product service marks are usually used to identify business services. And then our book talks to us about trade dress. And we're going to talk more about this later on in our class today. But it goes to the product shape or the color combination of this packaging. And then the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office has granted protection to trade dress characteristics so long as the mark holder proves that the trade dress provides an exclusive link to the source product in the consumer's mind. See, when I see this Hershey, see this Hershey bar right here? If I open up my Twix, my Twix and, 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 and out pops this thing right here, I'll be like, wait a minute, that's not Twix. But when I put it in my mouth, it's going to function just like a, a Hershey. It's going to function just like it doesn't go to the functionality. It's just going to be chocolate in my mouth. 
I'm going to open up that Twix. Out pops this Hershey. I'm going to be like, oh. I'm going to put it in my mouth. It's going to be like, oh. That tastes like chocolate. Twix has got some more stuff. Well, okay. Okay, so okay, what example? What, okay, what example? You okay? Like, like crunch bars. Like crunch bars. Okay, like crunch bars. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. okay. <laughs> but see, when you when you see this thing right here, you know right then when you open that up and you see that, you will be like, oh, it's That's a Hershey. bar. That's a Hershey. <laughs> that that can be Sorry. nothing else but a Hershey. When you open it up, if you're like me, you just open it up and you say, hmm, I'm just going to see. I take the first row. Yeah, because you can't break off the corner. Right. <laughs> I can't break this corner, but so I break off this first row, then I'm just going to take one by one by one. That's how I do. How, how, do, how, do, you, how do you do? Did you do the same thing? No, he just takes one bite, one try. <laughs> <laughs> <Don't lie. laughs> Do you just take a big bite? You don't, you don't, you don't. Because you know, you know, this is not a Hershey if you just. She's oh. falsifying statements. Oh. <laughs> it's a hearsay. Okay. So when you open that up, do you, do, you don't just bite it. I'm trying to rip the corner off, yeah. but it never works. You, no. <laughs> Who else breaks off, who will just break off the first row? Yes. Because then you want to be able to, take, that's the whole point. You can then take one little piece, at, just one little piece. Yeah, you feel like you it just, lasts longer. Right, I it lasts know. longer. Then you just take that and you just kind of just, just work on that one piece. <laughs> you don't just, just break out, just bite the whole thing off. No, this is a Hershey. This is not a Twix. You open up the Twix, yes. You're going to take the first one, you're just going to... You just, don't, you just go right into it. You buy it from the Kit Kat bars. Too. <laughs> oh, okay, so you just get nutty buddy too. Okay, so you know what? Twix is a better example, isn't it? <laughs> Twix, because Twix, you got the four, and you just kind of you want to. You don't. You you gonna always take that Twix. Open that Twix up, and you just gonna oh, you gonna break off one first. You gonna take the one. Kit Kat. I mean, I'm sorry, Kit Kat. You're gonna break off the one. You got she's four. saying he bites those. No, he bites those too. He says he does not do that. It's because she does that. But, oh. <laughs> oh, this is getting sticky. Uh -oh. <laughs> okay. Well, now let me give. Okay, so trade dress. <laughs> so yes, yeah, so trade dress, trade marks. All of these are going to be filed with your U.S. Patent and Trademarks Office. And then our book tells us, okay, trademark, uh, service mark, trade dress. All of these can be held in two kinds of ways. You can just use it in commerce. And then all of a sudden, if you find that somebody else is using your trade dress, you can say, wait a minute, that's my unregistered trade dress. Or you can protect yourself and register that mark dress with the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office, which is what most people will do to protect themselves. <clears throat> and then I'm going to go ahead, I want to talk about the patents in here too because we're going to look at an example that is going to encompass trade dress and patents. So let's talk about patents, which is a statutorily created monopoly. It's like a monopoly right that allows an inventor the exclusive entitlement to make, use, license, and sell his or her invention for a limited period of time. It's not like a trade secret where it lasts forever in per perpetuity. This is going to be for a limited period of time with the trademark and patents office. And then a book gives us, I want to make sure that you read your book the way that I've been. I go in there and I really get in there and read it, which gives us the process of prosecuting a patent. You read your book like this, don't you? Yeah. <laughs> you don't want to know plead the highlighters fit. I have. Plead, I just plead the fifth. <laughs> <laughs> and then it gives us a step-by-step. -step. First, the inventor. 
and the Patent Council perform a database search. You want to go out there on the, pet, the uh, U.S. Patent and Trademarks Office. They have a database. You go out there, just put it in there, and see if you can find out if anybody else has something that's registered that's like what you have. They're calling. That it's, a, it's an intensive process, so you want to get somebody. Uh, they're usually people who can do this for you. It's an intensive process to go out there and try to find that information. Um, and you can search it, but you really want to do an intensive search if a person is really intent on registering that patent or trademark. And then the inventor files a provisional application, which is going to give them a period of time, 12 months, to kind of develop that patent so that they could then file their final application with the U.S. Patent and Trademarks Office. And then there are people there who have the job of looking at it and making sure that it meets the qualifications. And if so, then they'll issue the patent or they will say, no, thank you. And then we also have some uh, damages that may be provided to someone if you find out once that trademark is uh, registered uh, or if it's an unregistered trademark, you can file suit for infringement <coughs> against what our text calls the infringer at which time you could probably uh, collect actual damages, prejudgment interest, and attorney's fees. And then we get some categories of patents. Utility patents cover the invention of any new and useful process, machine, article of manufacture, or composition, or matter, or any new and useful improvement to that. or the design patent. So you can have one or more of these. There could be some utility patent that has, uh, that is a partner to an iPhone, but the iPhone may also have a design patent that covers primarily the invention of the or ornamental design of the product. And then our book talks about uh, plant patents. And then now, I'm going to go back a few, a couple of slides to trade dress. Okay, our book talks about how a recent trend in strategic business planning is to trademark a product, product design as a form of trade dress. And the reason for that, in my opinion, is because it is a difficult process to be able to determine the patentability of a particular product. You have to meet these standards, a novelty standard and a non-obvious standard. These are kind of hard to meet. It's easier to overcome that trade dress to be able to uh, register a trade dress rather than to register an actual patent. So this is going to bring us to today's activity. Let's see if I have to do the commercial. Samsung has won the latest battle in its ongoing legal war with Apple over alleged patent infringement. In the most recent ruling, a federal appeals court said Samsung did not have to pay $120 million in damages a jury awarded Apple in 2014. Apple had accused Samsung of stealing its intellectual property, claiming Samsung violated patents on iPhone's slide to unlock feature, autocorrect, and turning out the numeric characters into links. While the jury awarded Apple $120 million, it awarded Samsung $158,000 because the company claimed Apple infringed on one of its patents, which organizes photos and videos in folders. Samsung appealed the decision, and the federal court sided with the South Korean company, saying those features were obvious, and Apple's patents on autocorrect and slide to unlock were invalid. 
The two companies have been going at it in court since 2011, and as it stands now, Samsung doesn't have to pay Apple anything. But Apple owes Samsung $158,000. Apple can appeal, but the company hasn't yet said if it will. Let's say you're industrial designer. So that gives us a little overview of where we're going to go in today. And before I move on, I want to see if I can find the volunteer who is going to be. <laughs> and so that we can have a real battle, I need to see if I can find a volunteer who is going to be the owner of Samsung. Oh, wow. <laughs> <That would be fabulous. laughs> really? This is going to be fabulous. <laughs> we don't have any babies or anything like that, um, so you should be okay. <laughs> I, I didn't. I didn't. I made sure to have any babies in this case that you could get upset about because of what that does. Okay, so here we are here, and you know, I'm gonna go into the first part of our case. Okay, so here is where we're going to start. We're starting with Apple Inc., a California corporation versus Samsung Electronics Company Limited, a Korean corporation, Samsung Electronics America Inc., a New York corporation, and Samsung Telecommunications America LLC, a Delaware Limited Liability Company. <clears throat> tell us that they didn't they didn't know they were they didn't know they were grasping at straws because the court found that they did uh, infringe on the patents not the trade dresses so, that was so on the district court uh, actually that's th that's this court there we're just going through it but at the beginning it told us where it's going to end up where this court is going to end up this court this on the court on appeal the court is saying that Samsung did not infringe on the trade dresses, but they did on the patents. How which, did they infringe on the patents? Because remember I told you, it's a tough standard. It's a tough, it's tough to overcome. But That's, what, okay. I'm sorry, if they didn't infringe, if they infringed on the patents, then how come they didn't have to pay the $120 million? Because it was the trade dress is where the is where oh, so that's what Apple sued for. Well, so. actually, really, this thing went all the way up to, the, up to the Supreme Court on the issue of the damages, where the damages were coming from, mm -hmm. and so that's really what the fight was all about. But in the end, the Supreme Court said that Samsung did not have to pay all of that money. So that's a terrible situation for Apple. You see, they went through all of that trouble messing around with the patent when it was really a trade dress that they didn't they didn't do they any. They fought the wrong fight. Yeah, they fought the wrong fight. I mean, the phone itself. Yeah, the phone itself. I mean, we have talked about the phone. Okay, nobody can come. Nobody can overcome this idea of auto erase. I mean, the other day we had a situation where the man, uh, what, 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 what was that? What the man? Um, he was a, like, he was a terrorist and he had his phone. Okay, what, was what, what, where locked? was that? I mean, where, where was that? What, oh yeah, the, where it was locked, it has the six, six numbers. But what, what, where was that? Was it here? Was it in California? Yeah, it was in California. It was in California. Okay, so uh, where was it though? San Bernardino? No, San... recently. I'm talking oh, about. Oh, I don't know. <laughs> talking where? about recently. Okay. Huh? Are you where it, it took place or where? Yeah. Was it in California? The guy who just oh, recently. Oh, who, who ran those people over? Oh, no, no. He shot up all those people. He shot up like the six guy, people. The guy who went. Northern California. It, it yeah. wasn't. No, it was in Texas. I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm oh, the guy. one who shot the church. We're talking about the one The guy who went to the church. The guy who went to the 
yeah. church and that shot all the people up in the church. Oh, that was oh, the one that okay. kind of escaped the insane asylum? Like that, yeah, years who yeah. was in the military. He had an iPhone. And after all that we went through about the iPhone, remember when we went through the iPhone with the San Bernardino? Yeah. And the people, the iPhone people told them, hey, you know, you have to do this and you have to do that and you have so many tries and blah, blah, blah. After that, it auto erases everything. And they, they give them all the information they need to do what they need to do. <laughs> they say to the guy, they say to, so then the FBI, they get on TV, well, we're not going to tell people what kind of phone it was. We're having trouble getting into the phone. Apple was like, hey, if you had just called us, we could have told you, go over to the morgue and put the guy's finger up to the phone and unlock it. <laughs> Y'all didn't hear this? <laughs> yeah, they said you have 48 hours to unlock that phone with the fingerprint. Oh, that's fantastic. And so here they are sitting up on the TV, the FBI, whoa, blah, blah, blah. And whoa, we don't want to tell people and the wrong, the bad guys, the what kind of yeah, phone. Yeah. We're not going to tell you what kind of phone. You all know while I'm sitting there watching yeah. this after we've had our class, I'm like, well, we all know it's an apple. <laughs> Wait, so this is with the Texas Wing Time. This is with So the they make the exact same mistake. Yes. <laughs> okay. Yes, they did. Oh, wow. Yes. No wonder they didn't want to say Yes. Kind of and they're sitting up on the TV and the press conference talking about, we can't get it. We're having trouble getting into the phone. And then so the, you know, the people in the media, they, what kind of phone is it? Well, we're not going to tell we're you what kind of read. phone it is. We don't want to advertise to the bad guys what kind of phone <laughs> blah, blah, blah. blah. To use. <laughs> That's so funny. Well, they, they might as well. Oh they gonna keep making the same mistake. So you if all, you, don't learn, you know you. that we discovered that they had to pay five hundred. Nine hundred, wasn't it? Was it? It was 900? like nine hundred thousand dollars. It was. Yeah. It was a lot of money they had to pay to break into that other phone. You would think they would be experts mm -hmm. on how to break into an iPhone. It's by a now. different branch of the industry. <laughs> <laughs> Hate to the tell you, they all showcase Yeah, it's got fired. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> So then Apple, so then you know how the media is, they get in touch with Apple, they're like, well, did, did, I mean, hey, Apple, what's going on? What's wrong with you? Did, did anybody call you? They were like, well, we called them to see if they called us and they, blah, blah, blah. We told them that they had a limited window of time that they have to, all they have to do, because the body has to be warm. Mm -hmm. So you got to go yeah. to the more. Oh, right. Yeah. So the fingerprint thing can work. The, it, the body still has to be warm. So you have a certain amount of time to get over to the morgue, take the phone over there. Who would have been the first thing? Should have been. Should have been the first thing. I mean, it's like, the, it's the FBI. Like, how, they should have numerous resources. Like, you can't, like, get one guy to go over there and handle this. That would have saved them $900,000. But now, guess what they're doing? They're back in the situation of trying to break, because I'm assuming, based on what I'm listening to them say, he must have invoked that auto erase feature which aren't they all did you have your auto erase uh, you got to, you did you do your auto erase you're doomed do like this lady did on the TV the other day she was riding on the plane and her Shush. husband was asleep she took the phone while he was asleep on the plane and put his finger up to the uh, iPhone opened up and he was in the doghouse Oh, oh. Now, now we have our, our thumbs on on each phone. So. Oh, so you use like your left thumb yeah. and like the other person. No, no, no. no. Yeah, I don't. I don't want to hear about this. All I'm saying is that there are certain features of Apple that are that don't go to. I mean, nobody. This is tradition. I mean, this is nothing that anybody. Everybody else is like, okay, we're not going to even try that. But a phone. I mean, how, what other shape can a phone be? <laughs> but <laughs> rectangle. I mean, the square. Phone is to be square. So they should have focused on the patents and functionality of the phone as opposed to the trade dress. They should have done more work. This was this trade dress right here. It's not even registered. <laughs> How many lawyers did they have again? Well, I'm thinking they thought this is what they thought. See, you, remember I showed you the design patent part of the lesson? They thought that they were protected because they have the design patents. But remember I told you how uh, 
you know, more, uh, I, I'm showing you how more and more businesses are, are thinking about the trade dress. They need, need to pay more attention if they're going to do trade dress then to make sure that it's, put, that it's proved up, that they have it lawyered up sufficiently well. So in the end, this is uh, one of the things I do want to bring to your attention in this case um, is that um, on the unregistered trade dress, I'm, I'm going to go to the other one, to the, to the registered trade dress. See, on the registered trade dress, see, the law is a little different. Once you register the trade dress, that's you're going to come in the door with prima facie evidence to the court that is non-functional. And then somebody else is going to, the other side, Samsung, is going to have to come and overcome that presumption. But once they do, then you're going to lose this legal protection. And that's what happened here. Because they were never, they spent so much time talking about how beautiful the phone was. But beauty does not go to non-functionality. And so in the end, uh, the court indicated that, um, that these trade dresses are not protected. The unregistered trade dress is not protected. And they registered this trade dress, and because it's not non-functional, it has nothing to do, all of the experts even testified that it does not necessarily go to the functionality Let's see here. Apple's user interface expert testified on how icon design promote, promote usability. So it's not non-functional. It's functional. I know this. Mm -hmm. It's very technical. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know why, to, you know, the law, why they have to get so bound up in these not non-functional. I mean, it's so difficult. But anyway, so in the end, what they found is that the, um, that the trade dresses were not protected. However, the design patents were. And so here are some of the uh, some of the information. See, see how they thought, because see this design patent is almost like just like what they're talking about in the trade dress. The rectangular shape and mm -hmm. the rounded corners and all so, this. So this was from the iPhone 3. Yeah, that's is that why it looks so, like think, so rounded? Mm -hmm. See, y'all, y'all something else. See, I don't know, See, an iPhone like from a J phone. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's more like a Samsung than an Apple. That's exactly what the Google Pixel looks like. Really? Yeah. I, to me, that all looks like a phone. Because <laughs> iPhone to me like is more sort of square. You all are so, I mean, to me, that looks like a, when I put this up here, when I put my phone up here, that looks just like my phone. <laughs> Yeah, but turn it sideways, it's different. Oh, oh my. <laughs> he turned it sideways. It's <laughs> See? It's way different. Oh, thank you. It is really different. Oh. Yeah. Oh. Okay. <laughs> They're technical, too. It looks the same to me. <laughs> Look at this. No, because I don't have the rounded top. Okay, well, let me just say See? this about this that. phone. Oh, that's not that's not even like your phone. Because that is a third. Well, that's that's old, it's an earlier version This is an old, old, old phone. phone. This yeah, is a this old happened in 2011. Phone. This is an earlier version of oh, I mean, this is old. Back when they oh, had okay, because I'm like, Sarah. Oh, no, no, no. I've never no. seen that right. round. This is right. oh, It's like the oh. three yeah, and the four that had the really rounded corners. Nobody oh, probably yeah. has yeah. this phone. I had that one, actually. You had it? Oh, yeah. yeah. You did? I know what you're talking about. Did you love it? I mean, I don't know. I did, I loved it. You did? Yeah, I did. You loved it being more rounded on the back one? It was really little. Oh, yeah. It was like way smaller than this. It was smaller than that? Yeah. It was like, and the little fat. Mom's mom, so she has to use those. Yeah, there we go. What is that? That is the 7 plus. Oh, God. Yeah. 
photos. See, they, they really they do amazing photos. They really <laughs> thought that all of this was going to be covered in their design patents and their utility patents, and they spent a lot of time registering those. Yeah. And then the trade dress, they didn't really pay a lot of attention to. They really had no thought process on it. Even when you go back and look at some of the testimony from the experts, it was like, oh, we just want it to be beautiful. We want it to be just a beautiful, beautiful phone, blah, blah, blah. And the judge is like, okay, but, okay, but you're saying nothing about how you wanted it, that how this, you know, what makes this non-functional. Right. And it was the apps, right? It was the way the apps looked, right? Well, you mean on the trade dress side? Yeah, which was... The apps are kind of functional, so. Well, well, yeah, because that's the whole point. You well, turn this phone on. When I turn this on and I touch this, I just want to be able to go. I mean, that goes. You know, that's not non-functional. Mm -hmm. When I, that goes to the functionality of it. When I go in here, that's the whole point. Is that I make it easy for me to function this phone. So that's not something that is going to be uh, protectable. Uh, as far as a trade dress is concerned, but in uh, in the alternative, they were able to overcome on the uh, patent part of it. And so, uh, I'll go back into this, And then we're going to just pick up just a little bit and talk about a little bit of copyright law. Fundamentally, uh, in order to gain a copyright protection, a work must meet a three-part test. It has to be original. It has to have some degree of creativity, and it's fixed in a durable medium. And then this uh, slide gives us some uh, t uh, information about uh, the copyright protections. And then also with copyright, copyrights, uh, the book talks about direct infringement. It occurs when the copyright owner can prove that she has legal ownership of the work in question and the infringer copied the work without permission. And courts have developed the substantial similarity standard to guide the definition of copy under copyright laws. Thus, a copyright holder need only prove that the infringer copied plot structures and or organizations that made the infringing work substantially similar to the copyrighted work. And then there's indirect infringement. It involves three parties, the copyright owner, the, in, the direct infringer, and the facilitator of the infringement, also known as a contributory infringer. Then there are some instances where, you know, there is some work out there that, that there are some instances where you, you can have fair use of that work without being accused of copywriting that material. And these are the, uh, specific for specific guideposts, the purpose and the nature of the use. Like if I'm using it for educational purposes, then that may be fair use. The nature of the work itself, the amount and substantiality of the material use, and the effect of the use on the market. You know, let's say somebody uses something for an educational purpose and they're not getting any value from using that material. Okay. And so we've talked about intellectual property. I want to see if there are any questions.